I would like to thank you all for coming to Anne's celebration of life today. I know my mother would be touched by it. Extra tissues just in case. <laughs> I would especially like to thank my sister, Heather. She was responsible for this entire event. <laughs> And family gathering. I think that I'd like to very briefly speak about my mother from the perspective of a son, as a parent, and as a grandmother. My mother was a compassionate person, 
very empathetic. I think she sought to impress upon both my sister and I its importance, its value, and to exhibit it whenever possible. That is something that greatly shaped my youth as it allowed me to explore the world and get to know and appreciate local people, religions, and their cultures. As a parent, I think sacrifice is a word that comes to mind. She really sacrificed her life for our family. I remember countless times that she drove my sister or I to practice, to school, to an event. She cooked and cleaned and helped us with our homework every day for years. I know now as a parent that is not as an easy thing to do, look forward to when you're tired or stressed at the end of a long day to go the extra, extra distance for your children, but she did. And the final thing that all of you know that defines my mother is her superwoman grandmother skills. <laughs> when she was around the grandkids, she was 100% fully devoted to them, as they were to her. She knew all of their needs, their wants, their dreams. She was a big part of their lives. Toys, books, crafts, food, whatever their need, she fulfilled it. So that is a future aspiration that I would hope to mimic one day and I thank her for showing me the way. But today, <clears throat> today we welcome home a daughter, daddy's little girl, the rule follower, the equal. Today we remember a sibling, the oldest, the leader, the surrogate mother, the justice distributor. <laughs> today we miss a spouse, the academic, the partner, the co-equal, the adventurer. Today we long for a mother, the comforter, the disciplinarian, the coach, the listener. Today we dream about grandma, the game player, the craft master, the teacher, the matriarch. Today we are thankful for a friend, the kind smile, the willing confidant, the infectious laugh, the helpful hand. Today and forever we love our angel Anne because tomorrow, tomorrow will come and we must move on. But today, today we celebrate Anne. Let's sing together the song of, of Anne, that, one of Anne's favorites. Precious Lord, take my hand.
I'm Charles Barker. I'm Anne's little brother. Thank you all for coming today, and thank you for leading us off, David. I couldn't have gone first. Our family requested that I be the one to give Anne's eulogy and to tell some of her life story. I feel privileged to do so, and I suppose it is fitting as the one who has known Anne the longest, as her brother for 68 of her 71 years. But to be clear, my own telling of her story is only from the perspective of one loving relationship, whereas Anne's life, as David has said, was filled with many, many loving relationships, as daughter first, and sister, wife, mother, grandmother, aunt, neighbor, friend, fellow church member here, and more. And each of us holds special, deeply personal and sacred stories of our own relationship and experiences with Anne. And I encourage you to share at least some of your own stories of relationship with her, of things you've shared together with someone else today, perhaps at the reception or in the days to come. Anne Elizabeth Barker was born on December 15, 1950. Gasoline sold that year for 27 cents per gallon. And our family car was a Hudson. Ask me after the service, I'll tell you about Hudson. Anne was born at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, then and now a teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. Our father, Glenn, at the time, was himself a doctoral student at Harvard, not in the medical school, but in the divinity school, studying theology and focusing his scholarship in the gospel stories, the life of Jesus, and in the history of the early church. Anne's first home was a second floor apartment above a small Italian restaurant in what is called the North End of Boston, the Italian quarters. I was amazed when the 1950 federal census became available online just this past April to find our parents listed there in their exact address, and then to find a photo online of the outside of their apartment, there above what is now Spagnola's Pizza Restaurant. Anne didn't remember that, of course, as a young child. Our parents had come to Boston after their years together as students at Wheaton College, and they were co-directors of a Christian outreach ministry sponsored by a church and designed specifically for the children and teens of these Italian families. Margaret was hired to work half-time with the children, and Glenn one-quarter time with the teens while also studying full-time at Harvard Divinity School. So they had three quarters of one very modest full-time income to live on. One colorful detail shared by our parents is that their neighborhood on the North End was comprised nearly entirely of families in the Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian Mafia. And they had amazing experiences, first being tested as outsiders, as non-Italians, and then being accepted and even protected living and serving there. They truly came to love their neighbors with that compassion that David described. When I was with Anne and Gary and family in Fort Collins this last October for a 10-day visit, I asked Anne if she had any memories of her first apartment home in Boston, and she said no. But the one memory she did have was of standing on a stool at a kitchen counter in the home of a lovely Italian woman, helping her and my mother make Italian meatballs. She remembered learning to roll in her hands as a very young child these meatballs. And this is a very fun memory, for it was living on the north end of Boston that our mother learned to cook tasty Italian food, and these meatballs were a specialty of hers. Anne showed me in October Margaret's handwritten recipe for these, attributed to a Mrs. S, something Italian name, I've forgotten what it was. And that was very likely the woman showing young, almost baby Anne from the earliest age how to make these. And all of us who are Anne's family, and no doubt many friends, have enjoyed Anne's macaroni shells and meatballs, served most often with Caesar salad and always with garlic bread and lots of butter. <laughs> Does any of you have a little bottle of water for me, a glass of water, by chance? 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Anne's second home was in Salem, Massachusetts, pardon me. The second home was in Salem, Massachusetts, on the third floor of a narrow wooden house about 100 feet from the bay on the Atlantic Ocean. A different family lived on the first floor. I'm not sure about the second floor. But in any case, soon after moving there from Boston, Anne had a new baby brother born on July 4th, 1954. That's me if you missed it. A couple months after I was born, Hurricane Carol struck the New England coast with such deadly force that her name was forever retired. Our father, Glenn, described to me as an adult the intensity of fears living through that with two little kids hunkered down on the third floor of an old wooden home being battered by wind and ocean spray. He told me he prayed through the night, fearing the whole house would be blown down. But it wasn't, and here we are, and all of us are here because of surviving that. And the photos of that damage are truly stunning, with winds so powerful they even tore the steeple off famous Old North Church in Boston. Any of this sound familiar, David and Julia? having recently lived through a second powerful hurricane in Puerto Rico, and of course seeing the devastation in Florida. But it is our next family home, Anne's third home, that is especially storied for us Barker children. It was on an acre of waterfront land my parents purchased for all of one dollar. The shore of a lovely lake named Beck Pond, lakes in New England are often called ponds, but they're lakes, in the town of Hamilton, Massachusetts. A small town of 4,000, first settled, believe it or not, in 1638 and incorporated in 1793. It was land that had been part of an estate then given by an oil baron turned philanthropist to what was to become Gordon College and Gordon Seminary. And this land was part of Glenn's salary package and a small startup seminary that had little money but lots of land. The $1 price was necessary, Glenn said, to make this a legal land purchase. Here our parents first cleared this land and then built a lovely two-story colonial-style home with our then-professor father hiring himself out in his spare time to his Scottish contractor to work alongside of him to keep the construction costs down. It was a magical place for the five of us, for soon Anne had a little sister as well as a little brother. With our front yard being a lake and four other lakes within a short walking distance and mostly undeveloped land, forest, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean five miles away, Anne loved all the outdoor activities of our family home, whether swimming, sailing, canoeing in the summer, ice skating, hockey, skiing in winter, learning to fish from our dad, playing in the leaves of fall, and more. It was very hard to leave our family home in the summer of 1972 when Ann and Gary were married and heading off to Georgetown University for Gary's graduate school, when I myself was heading off to my freshman year at the alma mater at Wheaton College, when my younger sister Carrie was heading off for her sophomore year of high school, that was especially hard, and when our new family home was moving to Pasadena, California for Glenn's new work as the Dean of Theology and eventually Provost at Fuller Theological Seminary. But that's getting a bit ahead of Anne's story. Anne was always well-liked with a wide circle of friends and a great student in school. Our parents used to review our report cards and reward us with a quarter, 25 cents, for every A grade. Anne always cleaned up with her straight A's, and Carrie too. Whereas I might have something like two A's, mostly B's, the occasional problematic C for a subject I especially disliked. Anne and I were four years apart, so we didn't overlap in high school. But more than once, when we were going around the room on the first day of school, and I would give my name, Barker, a teacher would ask, are you Anne Barker's brother? They all knew Anne as not only an outstanding student, but as so cooperative and helpful. That wasn't especially my own reputation. 
But in my defense as younger brother, I did catch up in high school reaching up for Anne's very high bar that she set and graduated as class valedictorian. Just wanted to set the record straight today. This is my chance. Anne was also a wonderful athlete. And we've been talking about that as a family here because those of you who know Anne from Fort Collins know Anne is very frail physically and medically. But Anne was a superstar athlete. Not only did she excel in all of our self-directed athletics in our neighborhood play, but she played on multiple teams throughout school, earning three varsity letters in high school. And I used to go with my dad to see Anne's home basketball games. And my only complaint was that I wanted her to shoot more. She was a very high percentage shooting percentage, but Anne would get her six or eight points, but she preferred passing to shooting, rebounding and defending to taking lots of shots. But I was so proud of her when at her senior year basketball award banquet, she received what was called the Coach's Award, given to the player who most exemplified teamwork and hard work, and who was called the heart and spirit of the team. That was my big sister. Anne also was invited to sing in a prestigious touring 12-voice a cappella choir. And at her encouragement later in my own high school career, she said, I think you ought to try it too. And I was selected as well. And so she had wonderful musical gifts on the piano and singing. One of the most amazing and formative years for Anne and for all five of us growing up was our year living in Heidelberg, Germany during Glenn's sabbatical year in 1966, as he was doing the research for and writing a textbook on the New Testament. It was Anne's junior year of high school, my seventh grade year, and Carrie's fourth grade year. And we all attended German schools, learning both German and French through language immersion. It was super scary for all of us at first, knowing neither the language nor a single classmate in our new German schools, but it became such a truly transformative year, making so many special new friends, living in and learning whole new culture, traveling all over Europe during our family vacations. Anne followed in our parents' footsteps to what became truly our alma mater, Wheaton College in Illinois, where she was torn between majoring in history or in physical education. She chose the latter with an eye toward a possible career in coaching and in teaching physical ed. I remember her telling me that her kinesiology class in college was perhaps the hardest class in all of her college years, learning every bone, muscle, joint, blood vessel, nerve, and function, etc. At Wheaton, Anne and Gary met and married the summer after Anne's graduation. And this past summer celebrated their golden anniversary, 50 years of marriage. In time during Gary's graduate studies at Georgetown University, Anne would not only take a job in the athletic office of the university, but be offered a full-time coaching job for the women's volleyball team. She turned that job down, and she and Gary were preparing to leave Washington, D.C. to migrate out to Southern California, which became their new family home until the final big move here to Fort Collins. One of Anne's summer jobs during college was waitressing at our family's favorite seafood restaurant named Misty Acres in the neighboring Oceanside town of Essex. Anne was a terrific waitress, always with her big smile, so genuinely friendly, helpful, efficient. She made good money in tips. But what I especially remember is her coming home from work late each evening smelling of fried seafood and french fries. Not an entirely unpleasant smell, but not entirely pleasant either, and immediately heading straight to the shower before going to bed. I remember eating there a couple of times with our mother, requesting Anne as our waitress, of course, and Margaret leaving a tip slightly more than the total cost of the meal. <laughs> Anne's Southern California years can be summed up in just two words, David, and Heather. She loved having her son and then her daughter. She loved being a mom to these two amazing kids. And I loved being an uncle and living close by. Although I didn't like getting an expensive speeding ticket racing on the freeway to meet baby David after he was born. 
I was so excited to meet our newest family member that I didn't even see the cop following me up onto the on-ramp on the freeway. The exact quote after he pulled me over to ticket me was, Sir, you took off like a bat out of hell. What was that about? And I told him about having a new baby in our family. I think he gave me a little discount, but not too much for that, David. <laughs> it was a new car. <laughs> And so enjoyed each stage of David and Heather's growing up years, and was so proud of each of you, celebrating the multitude of your accomplishments, whether in sports, music, school, Girl Scouts, or whatever the context. Sure, she and David could have their battles at times, two magnificent, strong-willed persons getting after it on occasion. David, I remember one call from my sister asking my perspective as a dad when she was going to ground you for a whole month for wearing through the bottoms of your rollerblades without simply changing the wheels. She said, now we've got to throw them away and buy new rollerblades. I listened empathetically, but then I tried to talk her down to three days maximum as your sentence instead. <laughs> and I remember her saying, no way, it's got to be at least a week. I was looking out for you, buddy. <laughs> but Anne adored David and Heather, meeting their friends, having their friends over to the house, encouraging their delight, learning and growth in every way. And it was such a gift and delight to me and my family to be nearby in order to get together to share many special family gatherings at Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays, and other special occasions. And in time, we celebrated the addition of two new family members through marriage, as the magnificent Julia and the marvelous Jason joined the family. I had the great privilege of officiating at both weddings, and Anne has so treasured her daughter-in-law and her son-in-law. The last big move and transition in Anne's life, not counting the biggest move of all from her earthly life to her new life in heaven, came in 2008 when Anne and Gary relocated here to Fort Collins as part of the relocation of Gary's Christian Mission Teaching Institute, ELIC, from Southern California to Fort Collins. Anne's years here involved finding a new home, a new home church right here at Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church, meeting new neighbors, making new friends, enjoying Rocky Mountain National Park and Estes Park, hosting, visiting friends, family, and ELI teachers and staff, travels with Gary to China and Thailand and six or eight other places internationally that we saw in the slides this morning. Anne especially enjoyed precious summer vacation shared with Carrie, her little sister, and Seth, and Anne's beloved and precious nieces, Hannah and Rachel and especially adding even more delightful and amazing grandchildren. And in time, the relocation of daughter Heather and Jason and three grandchildren to very nearby, which was such a special blessing to Anne. These Fort Collins years have also been marked by very difficult medical conditions coming one on top of the next, on top of the next, including a stroke suffered in Thailand, a heart attack, open heart surgery, quadruple bypass surgery, carotid artery surgery, countless eye surgeries, surgical preparation for dialysis. She's been through a lot, to put it mildly. And during these years of Anne's medical challenges and physical sufferings, she and I have talked by phone for about an hour, at least every other week. And these conversations took on an especially spiritual character. We talked about finding meaning in suffering. We talked about our own parents' similar challenges with our mother dying from cancer quite young at 57 and our dad from a heart attack at 63. We shared scriptures that were especially meaningful to each of us. I shared with Anne on more than one occasion something I had first read as an undergrad student at Wheaton College, a little spiritual book titled The Divine Milieu by Father Pierre Teilhard de Chardin a Catholic priest, a spiritual writer, a teacher, a paleontologist. Teilhard reflects on what he calls hallowing our shocks and diminishments. I love that phrase, 
hallowing our shocks and diminishments. And then he writes, not everything is immediately good for those who know God, but everything is capable of becoming good. Not everything is immediately good for those who know God, but everything is capable of becoming good. And in these last years especially, I came to know and treasure the shape of Anne's spirituality. She valued and was strengthened through study and meditation in Scripture, often quoting to me something from her weekly Bible study or from a sermon here on Sunday. She valued and was deeply committed to prayer, praying daily for each of her family, for our extended family, and for friends with special needs. She valued praying together with others in her intercessory prayer group. She valued weekly worship here in her home church. She worked hard to figure out how to have enough battery power in her portable oxygen concentrator to be able to be here in person, to be able to worship here in person. She continued to practice hospitality in her home, welcoming family, friends, ELI folks coming through the area and others. She valued supporting not only Gary's mission with ELI, but other Christian ministries she was especially connected to, such as the work of our Lutheran pastor's son, Jonathan, among the poor of Kenosha, Wisconsin, or my own later ministries as a university pastor with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. She always enjoyed the beauty of God's creation with trips into the mountains and lakes here. But perhaps most importantly of all, central to Anne's spirituality and to her joy and her sense of meaning in life has been the blessings and gifts of having and knowing six magnificent grandchildren, a seventh on the way, three as neighbors here in Fort Collins, Micah, Dakota and Teo, and three in Puerto Rico, Chiara, Adele, and Solaire. And to Anne's grandkids today, I want to say that your grandmother adored each of you. She adored you. She was so proud of each of you. She was delighted to spend time with each of you, doing some of the fun things you each most enjoyed. She prayed daily for each of you and wanted you to grow in faith in God and in Jesus the way she had throughout her life. And here's something I want you, her grandchildren, especially to remember. There's a famous chapter in the part of the Bible called the New Testament and a letter called 1 Corinthians that is all about love and what true love is. It says three things are most important of all, faith, hope, and love but that love is the greatest of all. And then it says, love never ends. Love never ends. Love never ends. So while you miss your grandmother, like I miss my big sister, the love she has for you and the love you have for her doesn't end. She is very much alive now in heaven. And if you get kind of quiet and think about her for a few moments and maybe picture her face or a photo of your grandmother or some activity you especially enjoyed doing with her, you can still feel her love coming to you. And you can still love her too. Love never ends. Anne died in the very place she would most want to be. And doing what she most loved doing, she was cheering on her two of her grandkids at their soccer games on a Saturday. And she felt good that morning going to those games. And with her weak heart and struggle to get enough oxygen, especially at elevation here, she often felt lightheaded, and sometimes she even fainted. That day after Dakota's game, she told Jason she was feeling lightheaded and then passed out. I like to say, Anne fainted on earth and came to in heaven. And though that was a shocking and sad day for us, 
It was a gentle death and a glorious day for Anne. I had a vision awakened in the middle of the night a few days later in which Anne was being welcomed first by our dad and then by our mom. And Anne had the biggest, most peaceful smile ever. All is well, and all is well, and every manner of thing is well. Anne, we love you, we bless your memory, and together we commend you into God's loving and eternal care. And all God's people said, Amen. Hi, I'm Anne's little sister, Carrie. Um, this is kind of a day I hoped would never come, right? Um, I hope I make it through this, but I think everyone else is crying. It's okay for me to cry, too. Um, I think my brother really said it all, but the only perspective I just wanted to add was my own gratitude towards my big sister. Um, on that day, when we got that phone call from Heather, um, I was shocked. And it's not because I hadn't known how sick Anne was and how much she'd been through, we all knew that, but she just kept going. She'd always just kept going with open heart surgery and everything that had happened. She had still kept going, even living on oxygen. And so it all, honestly had come to feel to me like she was just gonna keep going. So I got that phone call, it was horrible. I got off the phone, sat down. Seth was with the kids in the living room, and so I could really be by myself in the den, and I just sobbed. I'm not a person to hold back. I just sobbed, open mouth, howling at the loss of my sister. But it was, it was interesting because almost immediately, just spontaneously happening a few minutes after that, I just started going, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Anne. I just started thanking her because I have so much to be grateful to her for. I am not someone who tends to think of heaven as far off. It may be. I tend to more think that when people die, they pass and they're right here. So it felt very right to me to talk to her. And um, it's not just about thanking her for being a big sister in a normal sense. As my brother mentioned, our parents died kind of young. Um, I was in my early 20s. Um, Charles was in his mid-20s and late 20s, maybe even 30. My mom died middle-aged. My dad died just a couple of years later. And it had a very deep impact on all three of us. I think for my sister, what she would say to me, what Anne would say is that she would go to funerals sometimes and just feel like she was sobbing as one bereft, bereft. And she would realize she was still sobbing about the death of our parents. Um, and Charles recently shared with me that there was kind of this sense of exhaustion and um, just worn down feeling, thinking of Anne and then our parents. This is more how it affected him. Uh, for me, I was single and I was living by myself in New York City when this all happened, and so I was very much on my own. And I really felt that. It's great that we have a heavenly home to look forward to, but we need an earthly home too. And I really had a very deep sense of that was gone. I had nothing. But my sister really opened her home to me. And every Christmas, I would go home and she would be there and I would go for like two weeks and stay with them and I'd go on summer vacations. My brother did the same, <laughs> but he's still here in the flesh so I can thank him in the flesh. This is more Anne's day. Um, but it was really amazing. And um, Gary's younger sister, Lois, is here. And I know she had the same experience. We talked about it yesterday, that she also, as a single woman at that time, felt so welcomed by Anne into their home to go on vacation, to be with them. And so she created a second family for me. And in a good way, was like a second mom. Maybe not with all the bad stuff, <laughs> but just in the good way. And then years later, when I did get married, again, I'm on my own. Usually a mom would help you with your wedding. I didn't have that. And they came east. The day of the wedding, we got married outdoors. The day of the wedding, um, you know, you're back someplace, they're doing your hair, they're doing your makeup, whatever. We look outside and 
And in, in the middle of the night, these goose, these geese have come and they've kind of pooped all over the beautiful green lawn where we're going to get married and everyone's going to sit. And Anne is out there in her beautiful dress picking up all the poop to help us. This is so Anne, finding every way to help. Then, uh, years later, when we adopted our first daughter, Hannah, who's <laughs> right there, um, she came east to help me. Again, is in the way a mom would do. Seth had to leave for a time, and Anne came and was with me. And it was so beautiful. And then over the years, again, we have no grandparents on this side of the family. And um, Anne, again, opened her heart and would welcome uh, Hannah and Rachel and Seth and me to come and spend a lot of time with them. It meant so much to us. So since I do think of those who have passed on as here, I want to say it in this beautiful church, her home. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much for everything you did for me. And my daughters, or at least one of them, would like to come up. Hannah, do you want to come up and join me? These are some things they are especially grateful for that we're going to just I'm going to read it, and you're going to stand with me, okay? These are some special things that they got to do with Anne that they are especially grateful for. Card games, going to the candy store, Rocket Fizz, going to Yellowstone with Anne, going to the Grand Tetons, helping her carry her oxygen tank, kayaking in Morro Bay. We just did that like a month ago. I couldn't believe Anne could do it all visits with her in Fort Collins, going fishing with Anne, going to the pool to swim with her, which she could still do, reading with her, making food with her, especially s'mores, and being her canes so she could walk. They would get on either side sometimes and help her. So I am incredibly grateful to my sister for everything she did. Brothers and sisters, it's good to see you. My name is Kelly Vanderwoudy. I've had the honor of being the pastor here for the past four years. Um, and so I've only gotten to know Gary and Ann for a, a few years. Um, and I know I've been only given five minutes, but that's a lot for a pastor, so I will take all that and then some. Um, so before I pray, there's just a couple of things that I did want to briefly share. Um, I know we're here to remember Anne, but really we're here to give glory to God. Um, and in truth, as I thought of Anne, and I think of Gary, I can't not think of God in that process as well. I'm reminded of the love that Anne showed people, the smile that she always had, how no matter what she was going through, when you saw her, her eyes lit up and she always had a smile for you. She delighted in people, and she delighted in Bible studies, and she absolutely loved them, and I know many of us will, will miss those times. As I also thought of when, when Gary called me, um, as in many spaces in life when you're a believer, when you go through grief, there, there's a tethering to hope that happens at the same time. And so when, when Gary told me that she passed, my heart was broken, and yet um, in that pause, I was delighted. Um, because I've only known Anne a couple years, everything that I've known of Anne has been her health issues, as was brought up by Charles. Um, and, and Charles talked about this too, um, that when I thought of Anne passing and spending this day uh, celebrating a, a grandkid's soccer um, and then collapsing, what brought me joy was this understanding of then waking up without an oxygen tank, without a tube, staring in the eyes of Jesus. That is everything we hope for and, and everything that we want to do and to, to live a life of love uh, in the midst of, of health. Um, and you know, well done, servant. It's because of her joy and faith and hope and love that Anne had in Christ that she gave that to other people and poured that into her family. Um, and so through the grief that we have because of the hope she had and the glory to God through all of this, we can find hope in our grief as well. So thank you all for coming, for being a testament to Anne's character um, that she mirrored in her love and her love of Christ. Um, would you please join me in prayer? 
Lord Jesus, our saddened hearts need your comfort and peace. We do not accept death easily, and we may find that we are reluctant to surrender this loved one and friend to the place you have prepared for her. You know our sorrow, O Lord. You understand our tears, for you also wept at the death of a friend. Let your spirit, your comforter, the one you promised, testify in our hearts to your loving presence. Be our constant companion, Lord, as we live through these painful days ahead, so that even as we mourn the passing of a wife, a sister, a daughter, a mother, a grandmother, a friend, that we may give witness to our living faith in you. Lord, we thank you for Anne, for how she treated and loved others, as that was a testament to her faith in you and your love of her. May the love of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is beyond all understanding, Bless and console us, and gently wipe every tear from our eyes. In the name of our Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Hi, 
Um, I'm going to share something on behalf of my dad. This afternoon, you have heard a lot about how Anne's life impacted us and what she meant to us all. Parenthetically, Anne would be rather embarrassed by all of this, all this attention, um, since she preferred not to be in the spotlight, even when it was deserved and appropriate. So I'd like to offer a one-minute message from Anne to all of us here today. First, she would want us to know that she had profoundly experienced God's bountiful love and extravagant grace in her heart and soul. And as a result, she was able to demonstrate God's love to others with a special heart for children. Her prayer and desire would be that each of us here today would also personally experience God's bountiful love and extravagant grace. And we join her in this prayer. Um, I wanted to just say thank you to all of you for coming and for sharing in this time with us. Um, there's more down in the reception area. We have set up tables um, that have pictures and have um, more information than you've heard today about her life. Um, there are pictures of her in Germany and of those grandkids that you've heard so much about. So I would love to invite you all to join us downstairs um, for some refreshments. Um, and to wander and learn maybe more about my mom than you have already known. Um, I would love if you would let our family um, just exit out first. Um, and while they exit, we're going to run the PowerPoint um, that my brother made with some more pictures um, of my mom. Um, so again, thank you all, and please join us downstairs. <laughs>
Thank you.